the ones who, we all know this, uh, that if it sounds too good to be true, chances are what? It is. About two years ago, a friend on Facebook sent me a message, and they said, I have good news for you. I said, what happened? So I said, well, uh, this morning I was watching the morning news, I think on NBC, and Mark Zuckerberg was giving away $10,000 to various people who use Facebook, and they said, you're one of them. This is my Facebook friend, really. Weren't you watching? I say, I never watched the morning news. And so I went and checked it out because I thought I won $10,000. And the deal was, if I sent that company $2,000, then they'd send me a check in the mail for $10,000. If it sounds too good to be true, then what? It is. If you ever receive an email, once in a while I receive an email like this, and it said, Dear Reverend Muse, uh, so-and-so just died in Brazil, and he has $4 million that no one claimed, and we would like to send it to your church to help you with the ministry there. The only thing we ask is that you send us your social security number and your bank accounts for us to deposit. So if it sounds too good to be true, then what? Yeah. I'm sure we all got those phone calls about the wonderful resort vacations. You know what I mean? So we all sort of somewhat hesitant. If it sounds too good to be true, then it is. But for us believers... We hold that since Jesus died for our sins, that we are saved. And to a lot of people, it sounds too good to be true. When I was a vicar, a young man, uh, uh, our neighbor, approached me and said, just what is it that you're studying and what do you believe? And I said, it's rather simple. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for the whole world. And he looks at me and says, is that it? I said, basically, yes. To him, it sounded odd because it was what? Too good to be true. What do you mean? The base of my faith is that Jesus died on the cross and saved us all. That just sounds too good to be true. So sometimes we like to believe that we're paroled, that there, there's something that we have to do about it. Sometimes we believe, oh, no, no, no I, I just don't believe that Jesus dying for my sins is enough for me to have salvation and be forgiven. There's always something we have to do. It's like being paroled. Now, now when I see being paroled, I think, of, think about this. You ever gone to the dentist? You know what I mean? You're sitting in the chair. And you're waiting for the doctor to come in after your teeth have been cleaned. They're making sure you don't have cavities. And you sort of feel like you're what? Paroled. Now, you don't have to admit it. Have you ever been pulled over by a sheriff or a police officer? You know what that's like? I'm glad you're admitting it. It happened to me once. No, it happened to me twice. Well, no, actually, let's move on to our topic, okay? <laughs> All right, I mean, okay. You sort of feel paroled. You ever been in the hospital? Ever been in the principal's office? You almost feel paroled. You ever owned a big debt, trying to pay it off, trying to keep the bill straight? You almost feel paroled. You almost feel like you're under bondage. So the point is that for us believers, we've been pardoned, totally forgiven or not under parole. You see, Christ paid in full. Well, I'd like to tell you a story about a man who thought he was paroled and he's looking for a pardon. And he was sort of a cheat. He cheated people for a living. He took advantage of them, and he did so on behalf of the government. And people really despised him. And he made a pretty good living, but he's really an unpopular guy, and that got to him. So he went to the religious leaders and said, I'm really dealing with this problem, because you see, I cheat people for a living. I, I take things I don't want to take. I even work for a government that I think is somewhat oppressive to us. And the religious leader said, listen, you'll never be as good as us. Get out of here. I mean, you just don't fit in. You're not one of us. You work for them. You steal money. You'll never fit in with us. So he's a man who's looking to be pardoned, but in reality, he's under parole. And so he decided one day that he heard somebody who might help him, and he climbed up the sycamore tree. To whom do I speak? Say it. Yeah, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He thought he was paroled. He used to cheat and steal people, and the church told me I would never be good enough. When Jesus encountered him, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Hopefully it's a good supper. No, I'm just kidding. Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. And there he was forgiven. He was pardoned of his sins. Totally pardoned, almost if it's too good to be true. And in some ways, I'm giving you a, a poor old man's search of a full pardon he found in Jesus. In some ways, I'm giving you a foretaste for next week's Reformation Sunday. Now, I do have to admit to you that I'm a Reformation geek. Notice I said I'm not a Reformation scholar. I'm a Reformation geek. I just really love Reformation history because right now we're sort of in the 500th anniversary of the Reformation fever. 
Two years ago, we celebrated Luther nailing the what? Which had a profound impact not only on the church, but the world. Last year, we celebrated Luther's Sermon on Grace. And this year, 500 years ago, since I'm a Reformation geek, two things happened. The Leipzig debate and printed lectures on Galatians. I told you I'm a Reformation geek. All right, and so, in 1520, the demand on Luther to recant or be excommunicated. In 1521, that died of worms. Now, that's not like gummy worms. That's not like eating worms. That's a city in Germany where Luther was put on trial. He translated the Bible from the New Testament into a language people could read. And finally, in 1525, he married Catherine von Bora. Don't forget, Luther was a priest, and she was a nun, so that was a big deal, okay? So this sermon is going to be about an hour long. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just going to talk to you about 1519, two things. 500th anniversary, the key for information event of 1519. So I'm just going back 500 years and looking at 1519. So there's two things that happened in 1519 that dealt with the Reformation. One is the Leipzig debate, and the second is Galatians lectures. Now Galatians, a book in the New Testament. So let's talk about the Leipzig debate, and there is a picture of Leipzig. Now there is a Leipzig, Ohio, right? But this is a real Leipzig, sort of like in southeast Germany, and there's going to be a debate there. It's Luther, sort of the troublemaker, the person who believes in pardon, against John Eck, and John Eck is sort of a Roman Catholic scholar salesman, and they're in a debate. Now, when I say debates, this is what we think of. <laughs> okay? Now, does everybody know what's going to happen next November, November 2020? There's going to be a what? A president election? And there's going to be a lot of debates. Do you watch those? So do this. Pop a big bag of popcorn. <laughs> Get your favorite beverage, you know, right? <laughs> Put on your seatbelt, keep your arms and hands inside, and watch the debates, right? Because they're going to be what? Interesting. See, most when we think about debates, we, we think about heated arguments or look good for the camera, right? And we get 30 seconds in American debates to answer questions. For example, what's your view on national security in 30 seconds? What's your view a way to improve the economy in what? 30 seconds. Hurry up. Right? You know, th those are the debates we think of. So let let's not think about those debates, okay? But if you want to watch them, go ahead, all right? But this is a different sort of debate, okay? This is a debate which takes hours. Luther spoke for a few hours. X spoke for a few hours. Then they got to give rebuttal to each other for a long period of time. Now, sometimes we don't like these sorts of debates because we have really short attention spans. There's lots of things we have to do. We're really not really into deep thought. But in Luther's day, they were. So these debates took hours. So, of all things, July 4th, that's when this debate took place, July 4th, 1519. And the purpose was for the Pope's servants to silence Luther. Luther, we want you to calm down, and I want to we want to shut you down. So here comes John Eck. His purpose: we're going to have this debate. We're going to show Luther be foolish, and we're going to shut you down. And what was the topic? Well, the first topic was indulgences versus free grace. Do you know what indulgence is? You get to buy a sheet of paper that says so many of your sins are forgiven. So the more sins you commit, the more money you have to pay to have what? Forgiveness of sins. And the church made a lot of money. Now, we're not going to do that here, okay? <laughs> right? We're not going to sell forgiveness of sins of, of, for money. But the debate was, am I paroled and I need to buy my forgiveness, or am I pardoned by God's grace? That's the first part of the debate. But the undercurrent to that debate is this. Is it the authority of the Pope or authority of God's word? What's going to carry the day? is what the Pope says and the councils say and tradition says, you have to buy sin, or does it what God's words say that I'm pardoned in Christ? That's a debate. And they debated over that. So John Eck, he fired. He says, Luther is wrong in the Bible alone. We must respect the Pope. The Pope has final say, and Luther is a heretic and a blasphemer. That was X point. X point was you have to listen to the Pope, don't listen to what the Bible says, listen to the Pope. So Luther responded. So Luther says, I'm tolerant of the Pope. God put him in office, but then Luther said this. The Pope overreached in his false interpretation of the Bible, which hurts the message of Christ crucified. See, Luther's saying, it's just not that we're paroled, we're pardoned Christ. 
Now, notice what Luther said. The Pope overreached. So the question is, what's the consequences of those who question the ultimate authority of the Pope? In Luther's day, what happens when people question the Pope? You don't have to answer it. It's not good. So let me compare it to you. It's like you and I going to North Korea and tearing down political posters. Not what? Good. It's like you and I going to China and questioning the government. Guess what? Not good. So when Luther called out the Pope, he became an enemy of the state. He's a heretic. He's a blasphemer. Bad things. So let's talk about the results. Many people saw the Leipzig debate as Luther losing. The Pope's authority is in place, the University of Leipzig rejoices, the city of Leipzig rejoices, Luther lost. So sort of Luther like goes back to Wittenberg with his tail between his legs. That's what a lot of people thought. What happened is Luther's teachings and view of the supremacy of the Bible and its central teaching of salvation by grace is now in the open. And not only that, he'll be branded a heretic and will be excommunicated and, however, the result of that debate, God's angels rejoiced in heaven. Why? The message of salvation by grace will be taught, proclaimed, as Christ is the head of his church and continues today. It's not that we're paroled. It's that we're totally forgiven in Christ. And today, there's a billion people who believe and know that Jesus died for their sins. Not because the Pope says so, but because what? God's word said so. Because God's word says, I'm no longer paroled, I'm fully what? Pardoned, I'm free in Christ. So while Luther thought, man, this debate didn't go well, the message got out and continues to touch lives today. That's the Leipzig debate. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about, happened 500 years ago, is the printed lectures on Galatians. Now we sometimes don't like lectures because we're used to 15 second commercials and we really don't like to listen that hard. But lectures are really good if I can focus in. So Luther had lectures over the Bible over Galatians, and they're really blessed. And so he wanted now to solidify his view on the supremacy of God's word using Galatians. And here's the topic. So I'll ask you now, is there anyone in this sanctuary right now that's not 100% certain you're going to heaven? Any of you right now have any doubt that when you die, you'll be with your Lord in heaven? Everyone here can have 100% that we'll be with our Lord in heaven because Jesus, what? Say it. Died for us. You don't need to doubt your salvation. That's 100% blessing by God's word. We never have to say, well, I hope I go to heaven. I hope I'm going to see my loved one again. I hope I'm not going to hell. That is a monster of uncertainty. Clear that out of your mind, heart, and soul. We are children of heaven because Jesus died for us. And that's the purpose of Luther's lectures on Galatians. So, by the way, this message went, beyond, went to all the way beyond Wittenberg to us and still goes out today. What? 100% certainty. I will have eternal life because Jesus died for me. Do not doubt your salvation. Never doubt your salvation. Why? Jesus died for you. He paid the price in full. He baptized you, putting you in that relationship. He gives you his own body and blood, confirming that blessing. So Luther writes this. So this is from his lectures in Galatians. Let me read it to you. You must take for granted in steadfast confidence that he was delivered for your sins too, and that you are the one for whose sins were for delivered. This faith is a testimony which the Holy Spirit bears to our spirit. We are sons and daughters in God. In other words, what Luther says is, God's word tells you and I that we are totally 100% forgiven and heaven is our home. Sons and daughters of God. The Reformation. Not paroled, but what? Pardon. No longer in the hospital, no longer talking to the sheriff by the side of the road, no longer in debt, but what? Totally free. And that's a blessing of the Reformation. And that message continues today. It continues in our school, continues in our home, and it continues the church proclaims that. What a blessing that is. Now you know why I'm a Reformation geek, right? Okay? Jesus says that the Son sets you free. You are what? Free indeed, fully pardoned, forgiven. So how about this for a closing thought? For in the righteousness of God, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, 
The righteous shall live by what? Faith. Pardoned. And all God's people say, just like the song said, 